The Cube at Hadoop Summit 2014 is brought to you by anchor sponsor Hortonworks. We do Hadoop. And headline sponsor, WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live in Silicon Valley in San Jose for Hortonworks Hadoop Summit. Actually, Hadoop Summit really shepherded by Hortonworks and we're pleased to have another Hortonworks executive on, Sean Connolly. Um, Vice President of Strategy, is that the official title now? Still, what's your VP new of title? Strategy. VP of Strategy. Yep. Uh, this is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. Uh, it's looking at Angle, Wikibon theCUBE. We're here to talk about what's going on in the strategy. So Rob Bearden was just on, we had Herb on before that. Kind of moving up the chain of command here to the guys in the closest <laughs> to the street. Soon we'll be talking to customers, right? So like, um, I think that's the other way around. Like how you exactly. Look at it. <laughs> that's right, everybody likes talking to customers. We view the people close to the customers as really valuable. We've talked awesome. to a lot of your customers and one of the things that's striking about uh, this event is two things. One, you, you guys lack of bogarting the, the stage. You guys have opened it up to the community. It's not mm -hmm. about, it's not a Hortonworks commercial, right? So this is all about the ecosystem. Yep. And it's been very positive. People social, a lot of collaboration. You got big whales here like IBM, Cisco. You got Series C funding, which talking about Platform last night. They got growing their business. Awesome. And yep. then you got startups. Yep. All of them are doing business. Yeah. So it's Hadoop business now, it's like a market, yeah. right? So that's one vibe. Um, the other one is the success of the platform. The new stuff that's coming out of uh, Yarn and the data platform. The pace is picking up. <laughs> it, you're starting to see things coming together. Yep. Um, of course, by design, from your perspective. But take, take us through, as a strategy, it's playing out, same message from you guys, oh, we're sticking to what we said when we started. But really, why, what's going on now? What's inside your head around this marketplace? Well, it was funny, I mean, one of the themes I wanted to make sure we got out of this event was Enterprise Hadoop in action, right? Um, to really put a face on the workloads that are coming in on the platform. Um, and then also, you know, I had a keynote earlier this morning where I talked about, I mean, just two or three years ago, it was like, there's all these components with these animal names and that kind of That's stuff, right. and it wasn't really anything that held it together, right? Um, and uh, sort of the notion of Enterprise Hadoop and uh, a range of services that make it palatable to enterprises. I think you're seeing sort of the fruits of that uh, labor as the market matures. We're still early in it, but um, just the household names that are here that are talking about, like Sprint had a, an excellent um, breakout session yesterday where they, they talked about how their journey went and how they're, they really have a nice best practice for enabling new workloads to come on and a learning environment to encourage others to you know, innovate in and around data, right, um, to drive yeah. their business forward. And we're getting that, because we're getting a lot of customers on, and yeah. you know, so there's customer stories in the keynotes, AT&T, everybody's talking about mm -hmm. the AT&T example, we had the True Car folks on, the guy from the University of Calgary yeah. talking about, Two so years ago, it wasn't, you know, it was more still about how many lines right? of code have oh, we contributed, yeah, right? We're or, a top contributor. Know, what do these components do, and how do I fit them together and use them, right? So, so lay, out the, lay out the phases of Hadoop, because, um, um, Herb was mentioning that he sees it as Hadoop 2.0 really set the stage for that crossover point. You guys talked last year about crossing the chasm. Was it the year before? When was it last year? I can't even remember what year it was, but it seems like <laughs> dog years. But yeah, like, exactly. You know, that was seven know. or 14 <laughs> years ago, so, depending yeah, so, on which So way really, we count. The crossing the chasm really was right on track, so Hadoop mm -hmm. 2.0 sets the stage for that. Now yep. you see the true cars of the world and successes, but I want you to lay out the phases of Hadoop so we can try to peg the inning. That's what we always try to do in the cube. What inning are we in? Yeah. Well, so, you know, if you think about when it was invented, right, it was around 2005, 2006, right? We're almost eight years into that journey, right? And new markets, you know, take uh, about a decade to kind of play out, right? And I think we're, we're at that inflection point, I think two years ago at the Hadoop Summit, we had Jeffrey Moore, right, as uh, a keynote for it. And that was as it was just approaching the chasm, right? So now it's starting to heat up and you're, you'll see vertical solutions and those types of things. But I, you know, we have another three, five, seven years ahead of us for this thing to stretch its legs um, in, in, the, uh, in the market. And that's how come, one of the things I, I'm seeing early on is it isn't just about how do I get my initial cluster set up. It's, I already have you know, my cluster set up. I have a science cluster. I'm leveraging the cloud. And now there's sort of this sense of connectedness, or I call it tethered clouds, a tethered clusters, right? right. That, um, 
that you know you really want to democratize the data into the form factors that make sense with the uh, with the cost structures that make sense. I think that's going to play out next as well, particularly as you know uh, Hadoop technically can run almost anywhere, right? right. Um, Linux, Windows, on-prem, cloud, hybrid, or what have you, OpenStack. There's a lot of choice. Now it'll be interesting to see how people connect all that with their existing systems as well as uh, get the value out of the choice. So. Uh, Hadoop, enterprise Hadoop in action, right? That's what you said. Yep. Talk a little bit about the kind of the push me, pull me effect of people either having stuff that now they're excited they can actually do versus kind of the enlightenment uh, once they do some things to say, oh wow, now I can, you know, I never even really thought about going this direction. Some of the customer examples you see and how that's evolving within the customer set. Yeah, so um, it was interesting on Monday we had uh, we brought uh, you know, a variety of analysts together. You know, uh, Jeff from your, from Wikibon was on, as well as others. You know, there to hear some of the customers talk about their journey. And there was like you know, uh, like British Gas, which is 250 years you know uh, old, and they're doing uh, you know the smart meters in a million households and those types of things. But their journey is more classic. Um, whereas a true car is more of a, a green field, that, you know, not a lot of legacy to deal with, and they can go all in immediately, right? And so. Um, you know, one of the things that was brought up in that uh, Arun, uh, Doug Cutting panel earlier was, you know, each enterprise is different, right? So they're going to get on board with different, you know, sort of different drivers. I think the successful ones that we see are the ones that identify the applications that move the needle. And so while I'm all for cost savings and driving costs out of the infrastructure, I think it's underselling the platform if, you, if that's all you do or that's all you're looking at it is, you know, I'm able to drive cost out. Um, right. that's, a, that's a benefit of deploying the architecture, um, but uh, it, you know, there are new business, new business opportunities just being unlocked. And you know, I think the, the uh, gentleman from British, Ga uh, British Gas, when he t described it, he was like, or, I'm no longer a traditional enterprise. Old, you know, uh, I, I look at myself as more thinking about it from a telco perspective. And, a similar architecture. So drill because, down on the on, drill down yeah. on that on that use case. You said so. So just to repeat what you said, mm -hmm. folks that have been successful. One one use case of many that's out there. Mm -hmm. We've identified the application Absolutely. and workload. I'm assuming application and workload first, then deployed. Yeah. So um, Sprint was a great example um, in, in in the session that they covered where um, they. Their Hadoop journey started from the business and the analyst side, not the technology side. And they were tasked with bringing a bunch of data together and it was a research cluster. Figure out the art of the possible. And they came up with a variety of use cases. They brought one of the use cases to the CIO and said, here's the cost savings, but here's the use case we can unlock. And that was the first man in on the uh, IT operationalized cluster. They still keep their uh, research cluster for uh, educating the rest of Sprint, uh, onboarding interesting use cases that will prove themselves that are worthy to move in their cluster. It's a great best practice, but it was very much line of business and right. uh, analyst driven um, from a research perspective. And then IT came in as secondary. Sometimes it's flipped, but it was a really interesting best practice I saw. Which we hear a lot, right? It's kind of the age of not only the API, but also the age of the application, right? Yep. And all this infrastructure that's put in place so people can and develop, deploy, and roll out exactly. more and interesting applications. Exactly, and it's a, you know, that's what makes uh, sort of this enterprise Hadoop vision unique. And, and you know, again, that was a bit of what I hit in my keynote today was it's no longer just batch, it's interactive and real-time applications. Um, and it's really thinking about you know, being un, sort of limited in how you can think about the new types of applications that you can unlock. Right. Um, and you know, just translated into, you know, Red Hat today spoke, right? Um, I think both the middleware and the app dev side of things, as well as the infrastructure perspectives of Red Hat are relevant in this. Why? Because at the end of the day, creating a new generation of analytics, smart, intelligent applications, you need to speak to developers, right? And you need to enable developers, right? And so I think that's playing out really before our for our eyes. Yeah. Sean, talk about the uh, Yarn success you have, and also the, the Hadoop data platform vision is playing out yep. pretty well. Um, talk about some of the feedback you've gotten and the success of Yarn, and, and Ed, what surprised you about that? Um, so, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, you know, I've been, I've been at Hortonworks since late 2011, and Yarn's always been in the mix for um, how we evolved it, but you know, it's a little bit and came came out in the narrative I covered this morning in that 
you know, even when I first joined Hortonworks, it was literally, uh, you know, a cast of characters, a bunch of animals in a zoo. And there was no <laughs> platform, right, that it came together. And I think Yarn, particularly last year and leading into last summit, provided a rallying cry, a, a sort of a, a, a you know, a, a architectural center, if you will, right, right. to, to uh, these components be able to come in. Not only in the open source, but I think the uh, reception from you know, from a SaaS perspective is how can they deploy their value into and get the benefit of the bargain of getting as close to and natively integrated with the Hadoop cluster as possible. So I think one of the points that was brought up um, in uh, Davenport's keynote was this isn't an open source only thing, right? It's commercial ecosystem and a broader set of tooling, right? It isn't just open source. But how can open source enable that bigger market? To well, you know, if you look right. at successful platforms, I mean, at my age, I've seen the revolutions since I was a young kid in college, when the computer revolution hit PC revolution now, through all the different cycles, the best success platforms are ones that have helped make people money. Yep. Right, at the end of the day, yep. no matter what your quote religion is technically, right, if you have a platform and you can enable people to be successful, TCP IP enabled Cisco and these guys to create routers, you know, yep. PCs enabled a software ecosystem. So I think what's interesting about what you guys have done is you are enabling an entire set of characters and actors like startups, sub-series C financing yep. to get traction and grow using cloud and other techniques, series C funding companies like Platfora, who just blew through their B round, now they're in a high growth situation, right? Series C at the pre-IPO, and now the whales are coming in, IBM, Cisco. I mean, this is by definition a massively developing market. Yeah, and, and, and it's, um, you know, it's, at times uh, we sort of get accused of being more of the, um, so we're, we're less brazen about how we approach the market. How I view it, and uh, you know, I'm a fighter. I'm from the sort of Philadelphia area, right? So I, I definitely have an edge to me. Yo, Adrian. Um, but I view it as <laughs> this is, you know, if you're making a market, you need to be patient, right? And you need to have the internal fortitude to make the market. And the analogy I use is uh, Braveheart with the, the blue war paint is they're holding the line. You need to hold the line to make sure that you're going to make the market, the pie, as big as possible, right? And then I'm telling you, when we, we, get, our, we, we get a slice out of that pie, it'll be a, a fair share of that. It, it actually comes from my Italian grandma. I grew up with her living with us, right? So I learned to take my fair share, but not hog the pie, right? And um, that gets to your whole point on that is um, sort of a visceral way, if you will, of describing what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the market as big as possible to have as, va as much value for the startups as well as the whales. Well, that's your business right? model. Your business model is to make enabling platform yeah. and you're well, we're going to get a cut. piece of the pie too, right? But we, it's a fair exchange of value yeah. I mean, for yeah, the work you, that you we do. You ride the long game, right? Yeah. So you say, okay, if, you, if the ecosystem wins, your VIG or lick off the cone or cut or share, yeah. whichever you want to use, is big, yes. right? So that's an approach, that's a yes. business model. It is, That's absolutely. not necessarily saying that the whole world should be like that. Yep. I mean, others have their other, other companies have And there's own. an indirect and a direct. We right. definitely sell direct and service you know, large, medium, and small enterprises directly, um, but we also do it indirectly through partners like Microsoft and Teradata and SAP. So friction with respect is, is an open source credo, right? You say, hey, we can have friction. Yes. Well, self-respect drives it. When you have friction and no respect, then it's a dysfunctional environment. So to me, what I like about the community here is um, there are some use cases where you know the stragglers, there's some disrespect up, but th those people will die away. But when you have mutual respect and, and good positive friction, everyone will grow. And if you look at the size of the market that Rob Bearden was just pointing out, companies like MapR, Hortonworks, um, Wynn, Disco, all are succeeding. It's not like, there's so much beachhead. So the, I think the theme here is, validates the point that we were talking about last year is, Plenty of fruit on the tree um, across the entire landscape. It's not about fighting over territory. Right, and, and having done previous enterprise open source, you know, startups with JBoss or Spring Source and those types of things, I think, you know, when I look at, you know, I mean, at the end of Q1, we literally were selling GA software for six quarters, just six quarters, right? And so when you go from five, you know, pre GA customers to you know, 310 at the end of sort of the sixth quarter of selling. That's a fast uptake, right? Um, and I think 
and we're early in the market, right? So I think we need to stick to what we do well so I gotta and, ask you, and I gotta, enable I gotta, that. I got to ask you a question then, because this is interesting. This is something that I haven't reconciled yet. So in the old days, you mentioned previous generations of open source, distribution was everything. Yes. That was packaged software, right? In a way, Red Hat go back in the days, downloading stuff. Why is that not a big deal right now? Is it because distribution is frictionless? So dis the distribution variable doesn't seem to be a big deal in this market. Is right. it or isn't it? Or what does distribution mean? Um, so, you know and I'll, re I'll relate it to the open source space is, you know, from Hortonworks' perspective, our platform is 100% open source Apache license, right? You can go to our site, download the Hortonworks data platform, as well as our sandbox, which frankly gets a ton of downloads with a lot of partner tutorials and that kind of stuff built into it. Um, what we're finding, and you remove the friction on the consumption model. People will download it, prove the art of the possible, and if your technology is good enough, you've earned the right to have a conversation with them. And what we're seeing as it plays out, particularly the, uh, the folks who download it and prove the art of the possible and focus on single apps, is you'll get 10 to 20 node clusters where there will be just through the web, call for quote, right? Um, we had no interaction with them other than providing solid tech that they can get frictionless. Right. Not mother may I, not if I want added functionality, I need to get a license and those types of things. You remove all the friction on it. And that's been part of the model is if we could get the platform out in, uh, you know, in as many places also, cloud, on-prem, appliance, we also don't care. With, also right? with commodity open source hardware, yep. with open compute and these kinds of trends with cloud, there's no gatekeeper. Exactly. So, I mean, sure, downloads are great. You can download anywhere. You can, but the, you don't, you're not relying on bundling, so that gives everybody a free shot. Exactly. So, yep. to me, the distribution. So why not? Issue. Is the you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> no, it's and a I major, think, major. It's a major game changer because if there's no distribution involved, that means you can't compare old models to it on the distribution side. The consumption side, if you have free distribution, all free access, right. then the uptake is going to be the platform side. Yeah. Who, who can enable me to be at super agile and to build value? Exactly, and the other piece of the open source model is, um, and there's a balancing act between if you do introduce commercial extensions, that just over the past 10 years having done a mix of pure commercial, pure open source uh, mix of both, is the commercially licensed elements tend to get a much lower attach rate because the other stuff is, is like oxygen, it's free to download and right, use. Right. And so there's an inherent friction built into how many people actually embrace the other. The yeah. fear of lock or it's less you know, available, if you will. I mean, it seems to me that commercial is more about the comfort level and having some a throat to choke if something breaks yes. because I paid and I know they're going to answer the phone. Exactly. And that's really what commercial yeah. is, where open source is really about leveraging a community to drive innovation at a ridiculously high rate along a number of fronts. Right. And what I think is, yeah, everyone's going to make a lot of money and it's a pretty good size of pizza, but the much more compelling story, I think, is you guys are barely tapping into the value that you're actually releasing, not for the technology whales, but for the big whales that are innovating and using this software to unlock huge, huge amounts of value um, yep. that, that makes your business and the sum total of all the vendors playing in the space, you know, it's marginal, tiny compared to the value that you're going to unlock with the GEs and the Boeings exactly. and the GMs yep. and, uh, you know, pick your favorite, Telco, an electric company. I mean, yep. these are huge amounts of value that you guys can extract with the perfect storm of, of the kind of technology infrastructure and ubiquitous networks all over the place and cheap sensors all over the place and now a way to capture all that data and now a way to analyze that data and now a way to drive that data down beyond the data scientists. A lot of people couldn't do A-B testing. I mean, the value creation is way well, and bigger. And that's, you know, when Rob covered the sort of the size of the market growing to 50 billion across hardware, software, services, that's just one facet. To your point was, uh, Cohen and company had a, a great way of sort of phrasing it a few months back, and they were like, there's a big opportunity in the enterprise Hadoop platform space. The bigger opportunities for the ecosystem that can build on that and, and drive increased value. The biggest opportunity is for the big data practitioners and the people leveraging it to transform their business, right? So right. for every you know, dollar spent on uh, you know, the Hadoop piece, there's a thousand dollars of return to drive the business, right, right? right? And that's really, I think, the opportunity. Right, I mean, Rob said, stated an example of a process that 
cost $19 before now cost 23 cents. I mean, that's yeah. phenomenal orders of magnitude well, In the, the Wikibon survey that Jeff Kelly's going to release soon, um, 59, 54% of the survey said that it's both top line revenue and cost savings. So yep. you have not only the dynamics of, this, of the disruption, it's both. Yeah. So that's like, I mean, to me, that's the telltale sign. Exactly. And I think it enables companies to be data-driven companies that just happen to wrap that data around a particular group of atoms that might be a car or might be a hydroelectric dam, but at the end of the day, it's a data company that differentiates them from the competitors or whose might, atoms are Or it might cars, be right? seeds that farmers plant and right. you want to analyze the, uh, you know, which, which portions of the crops. Um, that's happening. I think I mean, you guys are exactly right. You know, analytics down to the seed level, for instance, right? We, there are new ways of thinking about what you can do with this technology. I mean, if you think about companies that have all this data, and Rob talked about the volumes of data in his keynote, that when the infrastructure gets set and you've got the containers and you've got the, the, the plumbing, if you will, the infrastructure of, of the inland data, and now you have a software-driven platform then the app size is going to absolutely explode. Yeah. Then you're going to start seeing more true cars. And that's, that's when you start thinking data-driven as a very interesting piece, which kind of brings me to my final question to, to you, Mr. Strategy Man, the chess board. What is the next big chess move for this community? Is it data virtualization? What are the cool things? Because now cloud becomes the intersection yes. point now. So, so cloud and big data are colliding huge. Yep. Right, so the platform layer, you're going to have a yeah, network virtualization. Do you see some data virtualization coming? So, <laughs> so here's how I netted out is in 2009, when I was part of Spring Source and this whole PaaS wave was starting, you know, so the pivotal guys, I'm yeah. familiar with them because I was part of that, is um, there's one thing to solve the agility on creating applications, but how do you solve the data problem? And in a Rune session yesterday in this keynote, we said the worlds of PaaS and Hadoop are colliding, the collision's happening. We're, you're going to see it, right? And so aligning with things like Docker to make it, a, you know, the long tail of any apps that you want to package up and make it easy to deploy and get the benefits of the bargain of data locality, that is playing out right. this year and next year. That's going to accelerate quickly. With your other point is, with the different destinations, the thing I covered towards the tail end of my keynote was the notion of uh, tethered, cloud, uh, tethered clusters. That is, you're going to have, you know, BI in the cloud for business users. You'll have uh, archiving in the cloud, but it's active. You'll have on-prem. You know, you need a sense of connectedness across all of these, and that's where it's going next. So. All right, so awesome interview. Really appreciate you taking the time. Final comment, I'll give you the final word here. In your own words, tell the folks out there, net out why this point in history in the computer industry and tech industry is so important. What is the big, Aha, uh -huh, game changing. We are living in a collision of events where disruption is happening across all sectors, right? Um, you know, whether it's data, mobile, cloud, right? Internet of things. Um, it's a confluence of events that, um, you know, there have been other ways before. We are in a unique position to see it all play out before our very eyes, <laughs> and it's really exciting. Merv Adrian says a 10 year maturation process and he thinks we're really early, very early, and it's exciting to see everyone really kicking ass, taking names, doing good business, being successful. Yep. You know, I think that is something that's exciting to me because you know, at the end of the day, when you take all the hype and FUD aside, you can see the work getting done, the foundation set, uh, Hadoop is talking about business outcomes. Uh, you guys it's deserve. not tech for tech's sake. Listen to the people talking about the value, right? There's real value. Important so. works. You guys really deserve a lot of credit and congratulations. Thank you. For being so open and transparent about everything you do. Thanks, John. And Jeff. enabling this. Appreciate it. This is theCUBE. Of course, we're extracting the signal from the noise and sharing that with you. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>